Um, welcome everybody for our next installment about of our webinar on the ethics of relating virtually. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. This is wonderful. And at least here in Bloomington, we are competing with the sun, but I think the sun that will radiate from the screen here today will be even stronger. So you made a good choice to join us here. Um, my name is Fritz, Fritz Breithaupt. Um, we will briefly introduce ourselves and then come to our speaker here. Um, I'm a professor of Germanic studies and cognitive science at Indiana University in Bloomington, where I work on empathy and on narrative thinking. And I'm Victoria Lagrange. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Indiana University Bloomington and also at Université de Poitiers in France. And I work on transmedia and decision making in interactive fiction. And I'm Sarah Conrath. I'm a social psychology at the Indiana University School of Philanthropy. And I'm on sabbatical this year at the um, University of Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. I work on empathy and giving. So we've been running this series now for several weeks on the ethics of relating virtually. Welcome to those of you who are new and welcome back to those who've been with us all along. We'll be running this series for the next couple of weeks at least on Fridays at noon with the same registration link. The recordings will then be posted and most of them will be posted on YouTube and available later. Ted Chang's recording on April 2nd will not be, it will be live only. In the series, we investigate the challenges digital media pose for developing positive relationships, and we wonder about young people in particular. Digital media have many ethical effects. They can amplify possible actions that impede on others. They can invisible, invisibilize ethical concerns. They can change moral standards, and they can create critical mass effects that can connect extremists. But at the same time, digital media promises opportunities of connection and inclusion that have never existed before. This series uh, has been leading us to consider a number of different topics ranging from AI, narratives of the self, digital activism, being in the world, and many facets of empathy. We're very grateful to our sponsor, the Lilly Endowment Incorporated, for making this exploration possible. And we just want to give you a brief overview of today's um, events. We will first introduce our speaker, and then she will speak. Um, and throughout that time, uh, you can send your questions in via chat or the Q&A. And we will respond to you and let you know that when she's done speaking, we'll have time for audience Q&A. So please send your questions in throughout, but we will have that period at the end. And now Fritz will introduce our speaker. Great, wonderful. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, and well, I hope you will all join me to welcome Suzanne Keen. Um, Suzanne Keen is, has a special status for me. If I run into a real issue, she is kind of my secret mentor behind me. So, so introducing her is really a very odd kind of thing for me, but it's actually wonderful. Um, but let's talk about her public persona here. Um, Suzanne Keen is famous for her work on narrative empathy, um, a term that she really kind of coined and um, filled with meaning in a wonderful way. Um, well known is her great book, Empathy and the Novel from 2007 in which she kind of takes us on this journey to explore narrative empathy. Um, she has asked me to be brief, which is very difficult in this case, because I'm a great fan of her, her work, and that book. One of the wonderful things about that book that I really recommend to everyone is that she's not trying to build a logical system. Rather, she observes a lot of interesting facts um, and facets of how narratives and fiction can evoke empathy, even if they seem to be contradictory, that different things can work to, to bring about empathy. And that's what, what makes this book so super rich. What also makes that book and her work so super rich is that she turns to fiction first here, not to kind of immediate um, interactions between people and can thereby see aspects of empathy that otherwise would get lost. So she observes, for example, that people are often more willing to have empathy with a fictional character than a true human being, partly because the true human being might actually then turn around and ask you for money. But fictional characters don't tend to do that, don't tend to do that. So, so, and, but that, she makes that very productive. Um, Suzanne has since um, expanded her work on narrative empathy and she has included a rich um, palette of topics here, um, empathetic inaccuracy, relatability, um, narrative personal distress, are among the things that she has been talking in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm sure there's something big in the make it work there too. Her latest book is Thomas Hardy, um, Brains, 
Tom, Tom, Thomas Hardy's Brains, Psychology, Neurology, and Hardy's Imagination. She's also, since we are partly running the series here from Indiana University, she's no strangers to Indiana. She has come to Bloomington a couple of times for symposium conferences on empathy in 2007 and 2011. Now, there's another side to Suzanne, which is also that she's not only busy as a professor of literature and creative writing um, at Hamilton College, but she's also dean of the faculty. And prior to that, joining Hamilton in 2018, she was also professor of English, but dean um, of the college in Washington and Lee, which means that she knows about universities, but also about teaching on many levels. She has, um, I mean, of course, she's a teacher herself. She works on empathy. So in her research, she has been doing it. But as an administrator and leader, she also monitors the teaching and the learning from students on many sides. So for us, of course, this is great luck that during the pandemic, she had to be at the helm of an institution on looking at what is happening in terms of teaching and empathy, which means that we'll probably get a very interesting view about the topic that she chose to present for us about. Um, um, so we're very, very excited about this. Her talk is called The Role of Empathy in Inclusive Pedagogy. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Fritz. Hello, everybody. I'm going to stay on screen for now to try to maximize the chances of facial resonance with you, though I'm not seeing you, my audience. And I'm therefore using the reactions of our conveners as a representative sample. Speaking of those conveners, and especially my friend and fellow traveler in empathy studies, Fritz Breithaupt, let me send warm thanks not only for inviting my participation, but for encouraging us to publicize this series to our networks. In my case, that network includes the faculty and staff of Hamilton College, whereas you've just heard I'm Dean of Faculty, and from whose experiences I'm gonna draw liberally in talking both about inclusive pedagogy and the role of empathy. I'm proud to work for and with a superb liberal arts college faculty who never imagined that they would have to adapt to an all online teaching modality until last March, just over a year ago. Faculty have also had to cope with the circumstances of blended work with some students present and others joining remotely and hybrid pedagogy designed to support the learning of students in time zones all over the world. I'm only going to use the experience of pandemic pedagogy to open up questions about what the spontaneous national experiment in distance learning and the subsequent variant of blended hybrid learning have taught us about the ethics of relating virtually or truly about the challenge of transmitting a mode of teaching that was designed for face-to-face -face interaction into screen-to-screen -screen interaction or into the textually mediated variants that we employ in asynchronous pedagogy. Just so all my cards are on the table from the outset, let me say that my thinking about effective teaching in any modality is rooted in a Frarian commitment to education that liberates human beings, helping us to help build a world in which we can cooperate, collaborate, and take care of one another. I think of educators as learners first, for education should be a process of discovery where everybody involved in the situation of learning collaborates to reach the goals of exploration, discovery, creation, efficacy and productive critique. For those of you who are readers of Freire, you will recognize that I am agreeing that learning is a co-creative endeavor, not a matter of filling empty buckets with content dispensed by a teacher. I'm further agreeing with Freire that teaching should challenge learners to examine power structures and patterns of inequality within the status quo, which is a keystone of anti-racist pedagogy. And finally, with Nell Noddings, Michael Sloden, Virginia Held, I believe that an ethics of care motivates the quest for justice and best accomplishes the invitation to a growth mindset that helps students empower themselves as they attain responsibility and maturity as citizens, as well as field expertise in the disciplines they study. The core principles are trust, care, and communication. And the core practices are dialogue and conversation, low stakes practice, the sharing of responsibility, and a willingness to change and adapt methodologies. Now I'm gonna start sharing my screen, so bear with me for a moment.
I am hoping you are now seeing a slideshow. So as a preview of my thesis, I'm going to be arguing that the work we have been doing validates the view that a caring relationship is at the heart of good teaching because an ethics of care lays the groundwork for learning in students who are seen as individuals and who are encouraged and supported in developing a growth mindset that helps them clear hurdles and persist in learning. There's rock solid findings in cognitive science for at least three of the presumptions layered under that statement, which I'm not going to be talking about. If you're looking for an easy starting point on recent science of teaching and learning, please check out this book by Brown, Rodiger, and McDaniel, Make It Stick. Our brief in this series is to think about the ethics of relating virtually. So I'm going to begin with some introspection about digitally mediated learning from the vantage point of a learner. Remember MOOCs? This was my first MOOC taken to find out what they were all about back in 2014. I took about half a dozen of them and completed every one I started, which puts me in a rare demographic. In 2014, 6% of MOOC starters completed their courses and fewer than half of verified participants finished the course. The percentages have declined since then as the vogue has worn off and fewer and fewer learners are even enrolling in MOOCs. I grabbed this screenshot from a 2019 article in Inside Higher Ed by Doug Laterman. As a PhD who is a highly credentialed learner, I was likely to complete and since I was doing the MOOCs for fun and out of curiosity and they weren't very challenging or time consuming, I did. I was motivated by an aim of defending myself against trustees who thought that the small liberal arts college where I was a dean at the time should be developing MOOCs since obviously they were going to completely transform education worldwide, replacing in-person education, especially the small seminar classes that are so costly to run with a tenured and tenure track faculty. So that didn't happen. Justin Reich and Jose A. Rupiras Valiente of MIT's Teaching Systems Lab studied six years of big data from all the edX courses taught by Harvard and MIT. And in an essay, the MOOC pivot from which this um, graph was, was uh, drawn, published in Science, they reported that the vast majority of MOOC learners never return after their first year. The growth in MOOC participation has been concentrated almost entirely in the world's most affluent countries, and the bane of MOOCs low completion rates has not improved over six years. The MOOC bubble, if ever it was one, has burst. As a compulsive MOOC completer, and perhaps not the best source on why this highly efficient, at least potentially democratic engine of access to higher education failed for so many students. But my experience informs my sense of the importance of relationship as a condition for learning and especially retaining new knowledge. This was my first MOOC and it was a ton of fun. I was motivated to learn about online games in the course because I was revising my textbook narrative form and Jay Clayton, a fellow narrative scholar, was offering a MOOC version of a real Vanderbilt course on the subject. It was really cool. I learned how to get around in the world, in the Lord of the Rings online. That's not me. I was very bad at the game and good at the parts about the novels, which I had been reading and rereading since I was in grade school. Jay had designed his MOOC to include discussion boards with fellow participants and videos with very high production values of seminar discussions with his on-campus students. The course worked really well. With the help of a teenaged informant, I integrated references to video games into my revised textbook. Years later, I have a vivid memory, not only of all I learned, but even of some of the people I met in the discussion board who were from all around the world, different ages, different backgrounds. One of them was a person confined to his bed through illness or disability. Now, a couple of months later, I took another MOOC, again with a professional motivation. I was still relatively new in my work as a Dean. And as an empathy scholar, I was curious about whether working on my emotional intelligence could help me do my job serving faculty better. An acknowledged expert on organizational leadership, Richard Boyatzis, a distinguished professor at Case Western Reserve, taught this MOOC. The MOOC explored how a leader's emotional, social, and cognitive intelligence abilities impact performance. Though the theory has a basis in social neuroscience covered in video lectures, the course used a case study method to explore failures and successes in leadership and help participants develop a resonant leadership style. So this MOOC was right up my alley but I can't remember a single thing about it, except that this was the course where I learned how to make the videos run at 2.5 times normal speed to race through his lectures. 
poor Professor Boyatzis. I didn't treat him very respectfully. He lectured as if he had been inhaling helium, but I scored well on all the embedded quizzes. So I think I got the content at least at the time. I got my certificate. I read a couple of this fellow's books, recommended reading for the course, and I did quite a bit of writing, including responding to fellow participants' micro essays, but it didn't stick. Why not? I think it comes down first to the absence of a relationship. Jay and I know each other. Professor Boyatzis and I are in effect complete strangers. And I think that the strategy Jay Clayton chose of embedding videos of a small seminar discussion enabled a distant participant to develop a narrative interest akin to character identification with the real life students who got to sit at the table with them. This technique provided a means of connection to the course through characters, learners with different interests and areas of expertise. Several were female, including including an English grad student who reminded me of my younger self. In my work on empathy and character construction, I have suggested that successful novelists often employ what I call a little women strategy with multiple options for character identification, not just a singular protagonist, offering different on-ramps for engagement that encourages completion. I'm going to come back to empathy momentarily. For now, I want to emphasize that these two online learning experiences felt different to this learner because I felt connected to the students and professors in the Vanderbilt course in contrast to the utter disconnection and even impatience I felt in the Case Western Reserve course. And I report to you that my knowledge retention from the two courses is also in stark contrast. These were MOOCs, though they ran on a schedule, they were taught asynchronously and evidence of caring about me, the anonymous MOOC student, had to be inferred from the apparatus of instruction. MOOC teachers do seem to care that their students can find and access the materials of the course, but that's about it. And I wasn't expecting care. Why did I learn less from the lecture-based MOOC? I'm an experienced note taker who knows how to extract value from a talk or lecture. Was it simply because I didn't see myself represented in the course? Those of you who were fortunate enough to hear Justine Castle's lecture a few weeks ago are probably recalling the fascinating preliminary finding from her AI avatar experiments, suggesting that an avatar who looks familiar and speaks to the black child learner in African-American vernacular English, code switching back into school English for the academic content, also teaches that child more successfully than an avatar using school English throughout the conversation. The linguistic familiarity layered onto the avatar's appearance creates a sense of familiarity. These effects of matching, which contribute to a sense of belonging, are also involved in empathy. For better or for worse, human empathy is stronger among and for those who are familiar and similar to us. This is something for teaching faculty to be aware of for several reasons. First, our own embodied identities are very unlikely to match up with all of our students, especially if our institutions have been making inroads on student body diversity. If our own embodied identities differ from the default images of professor that students bring to college, we are likely to have to work harder to establish authority and command respect, especially when younger. Out of the world of MOOCs came some concerning research about student bias, indicating that online faculty labeled with the identities of women and people of color received harsher evaluations on teaching quality and prompt return of work than online faculty with generically white male identities. In fact, the teaching and timing of assignment return were identical, only, identity, only the identities had been manipulated, but students' estimates of the time taken to grade and return work were unfavorable to female instructors and faculty of color. It's good for all of us in the academy to be aware that faculty embodying underrepresented identities may be receiving less empathy and indeed less sympathy, as well as less respect and admiration from students who are almost certainly totally unaware of their behavior. Lack of empathy or less sympathy for those who are unfamiliar or dissimilar from either oneself or from one's internalized image of an authority figure can reveal itself in unconscious bias. Hang on to this thought for the discussion of inclusive pedagogy and the role of empathy, because I'm going to be arguing that deliberately evoking empathy, not just for students, but from students, and marking that experience for metacognitive processing should be part of our inclusive practices, perhaps especially in the remote learning environment. Empathy isn't a gift that a good teacher bestows upon a student. That's the role of care. Empathy is a spontaneous sharing of affect and cognition. It's unruly, variable in intensity, 
usually quite brief in duration, and although it is associated with pro-social impulses and even altruistic action because of its other directedness, empathic response includes the more aversive self-oriented phenomenon known as personal distress. That's when the sharing of feeling and perspective is so unpleasant that the person experiencing it just wants to get away from the stimulus. I'm going to be relying on two different aspects of empathy in these remarks. First, empathy as a human response, feeling with another, that runs on the basis, basic shared manifold for intersubjectivity that is the biological basis for human emotion sharing, mind reading, and motor mimicry. This kind of empathy, I contend, is a major element of successful teaching, though it has its limitations, including a relation to unconscious bias. The second kind of empathy, I'll refer to as narrative empathy, which I define as the sharing of feeling and perspective taking induced by reading, viewing, hearing, or imagining narratives of another situation or condition. Though I developed my theory of narrative empathy for the purposes of understanding empathy in the novel, it is useful in this context for thinking about the ethics of pandemic pedagogy because narrative empathy, a form of human empathy, is mediated through story and text. Narrative empathy does not require the presence of another human being in the same time and space. If we can employ it strategically in teaching, it may give us a way of hopscotching over the alienating barriers that are thrown up by the modalities of online instruction, over separation, over anonymity, over masses of hidden individuals like all of you out there in this webinar, over the lack of access to ordinary everyday intersubjectivity imposed by remote learning. Please note that I'm not making any wild promises. Those who know my work will be aware that I do not think there is any kind of reliable connection between experiences of narrative empathy and pro-social action or altruism, as has been claimed by Martha Nussbaum and others. Novel reading alone isn't really going to turn us all into good world citizens, alas. But the research into the impact of immersive reading, especially when combined with mental visualizing or role-taking and perspective-taking exercises, does suggest that narrative empathy can change attitudes about distant others, people with different embodied identities, and even members of despised outgroups. I am presenting for our consideration the second kind of empathy, which is a form of fantasy empathy in the interpersonal reactivity index devised by developmental psychologist Mark Davis, because it is a kind of empathy that we may feel for a fictional character, for a non-existent being, for an entity that is not present. The evidence that readers do feel intensities of emotional fusion and shared perception with these inanimate objects made up of words on a page encourages the thought that this kind of reactivity could be harnessed by the caring teacher to orchestrate engagement and connection in the remote classroom, maybe even for whatever lies behind, behind the video off, microphone off, black square that is our absent present student. Finally, both kinds of empathy, real human empathy and narrative empathy, such as the emotional fusion and sense of investment that undergirds character identification, both kinds are powerful ele elements of inclusive pedagogy, regardless of teaching modality. In what follows, I'm going to walk through my thoughts about a series of questions. Why should we care about inclusive pedagogy? How is inclusive pedagogy disrupted or potentially improved by digital pedagogy? How does empathy support inclusive pedagogy? Okay, why should we care about inclusive pedagogy? Inclusive pedagogy is a supportive approach to teaching that values student learning and is determined to help students overcome barriers to learning that may or may not be visible to you and to their classmates. Faculty using this approach create an inviting and engaging learning environment for students with varied backgrounds, identities, experiences, and physical and cognitive abilities. It is not a remedial approach. Instead, it recognizes that student variety is an asset in the classroom that when sensitively validated, improves learning for one and all. Inclusive pedagogy improves learning outcomes when faculty make the effort to know their students as individuals, to acknowledge student differences, and take deliberate steps to ensure that all students feel welcomed and supported in the classroom. I'm quoting in what follows from Georgetown University's teaching commons where you can find a nice rundown of the advantages of inclusive pedagogy supported by empirical research. 
A sense of belonging to an academic community has been shown to be an important predictor of academic success. Many students, particularly those from groups marginalized because of things like race, class, gender, and sexuality, do feel excluded from learning spaces. This experience of exclusion can hamper academic performance in a process that can spiral out of control through a negative recursive cycle where psychological threat and poor, perform poor, poor performance feed off one another, leading to an ever worsening performance. A sense of alienation or exclusion can even lead to negative health effects. Efforts to increase marginalized students' sense of social belonging or competence lead in to increases in both academic success and well-being among those students, and those benefits can last for years. Techniques that help improve the academic performance of students in marginalized groups regular like active learning and regular opportunities to practice new skills tend to benefit other students too. Combined with active learning techniques to enhance individual engagement, inclusive pedagogy helps students meet faculty's high standards and persist when they have setbacks that might cause discouragement and disengagement. A push for what they call inclusive excellence in STEM pedagogy has been a focus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI, intending to address the lower rates of program completion in STEM fields by women and underrepresented students compared with their intentions on entering college and with their peers. There's no one pedagogical technique or approach prescribed by inclusive pedagogy. It looks different in different disciplines. Its watchwords are flexibility, equity, accessibility, collaboration, personalization, and awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But some of the strategies that often contribute to an inclusive learning environment are these. Establishment of rapport with students, and as possible, knowing them as individuals. Fostering a growth mindset using metacognitive marking to encourage students to see academic struggle as a path to learning through persistence. Scaffold as assignments, opportunities to revise or redo, low stakes practice, and a variety of assignment modalities all support a growth mindset and help counter both a fixed ability mindset and stereotype threat, both of which can inhibit learning. Employing universal design principles to provide flexibility in the presentation of information, in the ways student respond or demonstrate knowledge and skills, and in the ways student engage to reduce barriers and in instruction, provide appropriate accommodations, that part is a matter of ADA law, to support, challenge, and maintain high achievement expectations for all students. Students with disabilities and multilingual students are targeted by universal design principles, but all students benefit from their adoption. Using multimodal assignments, either as alternatives or in sequences that make sure that different forms of evaluating learning occur across the term. Inclusive representation of diverse subjects and persons in course materials, mindfulness about language, avoidance of representing one's own experience as the preferred norm, or of on-the-spot demands of individuals to represent the views of a whole group. Awareness of how one's own culturally bound assumptions may influence your interactions with students. This includes self-awareness of how faculty may assume familiarity with the academy and its ways and means. Overt teaching of the hidden curriculum helps first generation students take advantage of what's on offer and it doesn't hurt those who are already familiar with the ways things work in universities. Cultivation of an open classroom climate where mutual respect prevails, where difficult conversations can be staged and where bias can be directly addressed when it happens. I like the strategy of building a classroom contract together on day one or day two. Communication of support resources and normalization of their use. This isn't just about pasting the official disability accommodation statement onto the syllabus. Pointing to your campus's academic support centers is a start. Conveying the fact that professionals like faculty rely on peers to critique work normalizes the practices of using those resources. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. When I interview job candidates about their ideas for inclusive pedagogy, they give me lots of other ideas that they have tried or observed working. It's a work in progress, and with changing and increasingly diverse student generations, inclusivity, accessibility, and equity are always works in progress. So how is inclusive pedagogy disrupted or potentially improved by digital pedagogy? 
Many of the practices that I just mentioned are not impaired by a change in modality. Faculty teaching synchronous and asynchronous courses online can absolutely foster a growth mindset, employ universal design principles, inclusively represent diverse experts and subjects, cultivate awareness of their own potential biases and culture bound assumptions, communicate support resources and connect students with them and employ multimodal assignments so that students experience different ways of demonstrating their learning. This doesn't mean ditching tests and the learning promoted by the testing effect, in fact, encourages use of examination as one of your tactics. But in an online or blended hybrid environment, traditional examinations may be subject to academic integrity concerns unless your institution has invested in fairly high-end proctoring software. I'm going to zero in on the aspects of inclusive pedagogy that are most challenged by the online or blended environment. In my observation, those facets are establishment of rapport with students and as possible, knowing them as individuals and cultivation of an open classroom climate. Both of these recommended practices depend on more than the way a teacher conveys content, expectations, instructions, and support resources. They require actual conversation, skillful listening, attunement to the emotional tenor of student response and practice at reading the room. Just to state the obvious, it is very difficult to read the Zoom room, even when a small seminar group fits on one screen. It's emotionally and cognitively demanding to reach online students while simultaneously teaching in-person students. The larger the group, the harder it is to sustain an individuated sense of relationship. We and our students experience this in Zoom when a meeting becomes multiple screens full of black boxes with names. The larger the group, the easier it is for us to assume that someone else will take care of the problem or respond to a cry for help, a phenomenon known as diffusion of responsibility. Yet online environments have some advantages over in-person teaching when everybody has to be masked and distanced. I'm basing much of what I know about these circumstances on what the faculty at Hamilton did in the past year. First, just like everybody else in higher ed, they moved online for what was an unplanned remote conclusion of a semester that had begun in person. Fewer than a dozen of them had prior experience with online teaching in either the synchronous or asynchronous modes. Much of what we now know about the limitations of remote learning, especially when it comes to inclusive pedagogy, derives from that involuntary experiment. Some faculty and some students did not have adequate internet to support teaching or participating in classes held synchronously on Zoom. Probably the most obvious impact of the move to remote learning was the sudden obviousness of disparities in access. Some students wrote out the spring term in vacation homes with strong wireless. Some had to go back to work to support families who had lost a breadwinner to the early days of the epidemic. Some students returned to foreign countries or the West Coast and had a time zone challenge to contend with. Despite liberally handing out laptops, internet hotspots, webcams, and microphones to departing students, Hamilton found that some of the technological barriers simply could not be surmounted or not equitably. A major takeaway of this first phase of response was the stark reminder that when you are in a place like Hamilton, simply having all students together on campus while not creating perfect equity definitely has a leveling effect that diminishes the differentials of privilege when it comes to students' active engagement in their own education. To a lesser degree, these differences could also be observed among faculty. Central New York is rural and not uniformly blanketed with superb internet access. We had faculty who were teaching from their cars, clutching hot water bottles, parked next to campus internet hotspots. Governor Cuomo had, of course, closed our campus. Locked out of their labs, studios, classrooms, and offices, the faculty acquired a suite of skills, learned to use new tools and techniques, and adapted courses that had not been intended for remote delivery to online modalities. Anticipating the challenges that students in far off time zones were to experience, I strongly recommended that faculty consider asynchronous strategies such as discussion boards, perusal for text annotation, and pre recorded lectures, which many did though usually still preserving some synchronous time on Zoom for discussions, presentations, and office hours. Even though the exigencies of the learning circumstances and the disparities among students prompted faculty to convert the grading in spring to a credit no credit scheme, by and large, our students came to class, enjoyed the time together, adapted to altered assignments, and got through the term successfully. They did not check out. Though the epidemic itself took a toll, especially when they ended up as caregivers for younger siblings when an essential worker parent fell ill. The faculty experimented, supported by superb academic technologists, 
and by the end of the term became adroit in all the features of Zoom. When reflecting on their experiences of the disrupted spring of 2020, the most frequent comment made by faculty was gratitude that they and their students had been able to get to know one another prior to going remote. The established relationships re were regarded by many as the most important ingredient of their subsequent success. I will add that the incredible unstinting effort made by faculty was at least as important and that Hamilton, much of that effort took the form of caring outreach. To the fans of disruption who were thinking that online education spells the end of the four-year liberal arts college, our subsequent experience strongly suggests otherwise. When we opened in person in the fall, 85% of our students returned. And by the current semester, 90% of the students had come to campus. Supported by a rigorous and universal testing regimen, contact tracing, quarantining, safety protocols of masking, distancing, cleaning, and enhanced air handling, as well as dozens of outdoor canopies, we brought our students back if they could get here and if they felt safe joining their peers on campus. Those of you who are teaching faculty will be aware that some institutions made the judgment that staying online would be best. And other institutions chose in-person and then compelled faculty to teach in person. I insisted from the outset that during the pandemic, professors would choose freely how they would teach with no questions asked. With the distancing requirements impacting room capacities, we wouldn't be able to fit every class on campus. Many courses that were taught in person had to rotate groups of students through the classroom with the others joining remotely on some class days. And all faculty were expected to accommodate remote students, whether they were taking the whole term from a distance or had been quarantined in one of our local hotels as a result of a positive COVID test or being contact traced. You know the drill. So you'll recall that our spring 2020 experience of pandemic pedagogy showed us vividly all the things that are wrong with online environments for remote teaching, especially the exposure of disparities in students' home circumstances. Not surprisingly, more than 60% of our faculty chose to teach in person wearing a mask and to cope with the blended hybrid demands supported by OWL cameras for capturing discussion participants or microphones to enable class partition participation for students spread out in a gymnasium. This was incredibly hard work. I estimate and faculty affirm that teaching in the high flex mode required double the time to prep and deliver. Most students strongly preferred in-person classes, but enough students were joining remotely to make most faculty online teachers at the same time. For about 40% of our faculty, the advantages of online teaching outweighed the disadvantages of teaching in person. I will add here as a practical matter that every time we had a student test positive for COVID, it was a blessing to discover that some of the courses that that student was in were being taught remotely. Faculty teaching online in 2020 and 21 emphasized many positive qualities of the Zoom classroom. There were personal reasons, especially with the acute pressures of caregiving for children and elders. But in terms of inclusive pedagogy, faculty also saw advantages to teaching remotely. No one would be left out, Students would have equitable access to the professor and to one another. Some language professors felt that seeing the mouths of their students and their students' ability to see their teachers' faces directly supported language learning, especially for beginners. Many faculty found it easier to learn students' names in Zoom and taught online in the beginning before moving to the masked and distanced in-person classrooms that we were also providing. Faculty with experience in asynchronous teaching created rigorous experiences that students in multiple time zones could join without disadvantage. Good things happened when it came to inclusive pedagogy. Lots of experimentation with alternative assignments took place. Loads of experts joined classes from afar and faculty attuned to inclusive pedagogy made sure that some of those invited guests were members of underrepresented groups. There's robust evidence that seeing diverse identities represented as experts in a field of study, not just in the person of the professor, encourages underrepresented students to persist in their programs to degree completion. Some of the affordances of online study supported rekindled relationships. At Hamilton, arts faculty invited alums to collaborate with students who were collaborating to create from locations all over the world. The reconnection of alums with the institution through current students is good for everybody involved. Many faculty in STEM flipped their classes for the first time ever, pre-recording lectures for viewing before class and reserving class time for problem solving, group work, recitations, presentations, discussions, and Q&A. Faculty discovered the advantages of short recordings posted in the course management system, videos that could be viewed and reviewed on demand. 
Whether teaching a painting technique, demonstrating an application of a theory or a principle, or simply explaining something tricky, if that content could be captured in a short video and stowed in Blackboard, faculty found general student mastery suddenly ratcheted up. We did notice when reading course evaluations later that when multi-section courses featured video lectures by all the professors teaching different sections, students preferred those made by their own professors, finding them better, clearer, and more helpful and expressing less satisfaction with the lectures recorded by the other faculty. This result points to the element of relationship that has been at the heart of these remarks about empathy in inclusive pedagogy. So how does empathy support inclusive pedagogy, especially in the online or blended learning environment? Just the day before yesterday, the Chronicle of Higher Education featured a story that studied a deep dive into evidence about students' academic experiences during the pandemic. Grades have gone up, and it appears, according to Richard Aram, that students are spending more time on their coursework. Faculty choices may have also improved student learning. Here's Aram. He says, when you move to more engaging, participatory, interactive instructional strategies, student academic engagement goes up, end quote. Numerous studies of student performance in large universities, so big numbers, reveal that the social connection of synchronous class time is an especially important element for student success. Asynchronous classes that provided meetup time for classmates or drop-in office hours had better success rates, especially for first-year college students. A prominent takeaway was this conclusion. To thrive at a time when we're spending our days behind doors and in front of screens, students need connections more than ever, connections that recognize their lives beyond the classroom. Those connections can be with one another, with RAs, with TAs and student tutors, with professional or faculty advisors, and of course with their teachers, but they need to be with somebody. The sobering picture of a student alone in a room all day long communing with a computer screen does not support the social and emotional growth that is a fundamental part of the college years. And that's the students fortunate enough to have a private space with a door that closes. To a faculty who've been working remotely since last March, it will not be a terribly difficult imaginative task to put yourself in the shoes of a student who is learning remotely. We are all struggling with some degree of loneliness, boredom and pressure. Cultivating compassion for students in stressful circumstances encourages flexibility. I know that the faculty I work with and for added umpteen hours to their work week, simply reaching out to their students to check in on them or making themselves available for drop-in Zoom hours. Reading end of course evaluations this fall showed me that students felt a great deal of empathy for faculty circumstances. To an unprecedented degree, students saw inside faculty's homes, seeing and hearing the kids, recognizing the almost universal technological troubles and indicated forbearance and understanding on their evals. The simple recognition that we are all human beings struck many afresh during the pandemic. And that's a highly useful starting point for cultivating empathy as an element of a caring and inclusive pedagogy. In this last section of my talk, I'm going to make some suggestions about leveraging the power of narrative empathy to bolster a general atmosphere of connection and belonging in online or blended and hybrid learning. If you are already teaching novels, this may be as simple as inviting reflection on emotional responses to fiction or foregrounding discussion of character identification. But I am assuming that most of my audience today is not teaching novels. So what I'm about to do is extract from the literature on the impact of narrative empathy, some potentially portable strategies that have been shown to increase at least temporarily, both empathy and some of its associated effects, feelings of belonging, connection, openness to difference and reduction of fear or distrust of members of outgroups. Not surprisingly, some of these tactics are already part of the inclusive pedagogy toolkit. Provide images or descriptions of experts representing different identities and invite students to imagine being able to solve problems with them or using the techniques, theories, strategies, or discoveries associated with those experts. That's Octavia Butler. She was a genius. Encouraging students to imagine themselves occupying the position of an expert by engaging with the challenges of the subject you are teaching relies on a simple form of role-taking imagination, a fundamental of narrative empathy. Tell your students about your own pathway to expertise, including the challenges that you had to overcome. Somehow I had to travel from that lot with the crushed cars stacked up behind me through to get through college. 
This is harder than it sounds because we have all been trained to paper over aspects of our identities or experience that have felt like deficiencies. So try doing it in the third person. Talk about a fictional character based on yourself and divulge where the character came from, how she struggled and what she achieved. Up to, up to you whether you do a big reveal of the autobiographical nature of your character. Indeed, it's up to you whether you even share the results of this exercise with any other human. This strategy of narrative empathy cultivates self-empathy through the healthy process of expressive writing. Encourage mental visualizing. Exercises in mental visualizing can increase our ability to immerse ourselves in imaginative worlds. By imaginative worlds, I do not simply mean fictional worlds. This is relevant to the sciences. Those of you who are Renaissance scholars will know that imagining a secondary world was not simply a literary strategy as in Moore's Utopia, but it was also a foundational scientific practice. The image here is from Bacon's New Atlantis. Encourage escapist immersion. For me, fiction reading is the best and easiest form of escapist immersion in which I can most readily get out of this world into another one. But I know people who get the same kind of pleasure and refreshment and those time losing experiences of flow by working on solving a mathematical equation. I hazard that the kind of escapist immersion that leverages mental visualizing to evoke a sense of being located or embedded directionally in an imagined space is an especially powerful precursor to empathy. This has to do with how mirror neurons work in our shared manifold for intersubjectivity. Immersed reading, or what is sometimes called transportation, has been shown to increase subjects' empathy. There are some remarkable virtual reality tools that show promise in this respect as well. But you don't have to be teaching students to build VR experiences with Unity and Blender to leverage the power of role-taking imagining. The tried and true strategy of role-playing exercises in which students inhabit positions not necessarily matching their own improves argumentation skills as well as juking empathy effects. Finally, don't be afraid to talk about or ask about how learning feels. That's a couple of my Ulysses students indicating how they feel about reading Joyce. They're about to kick that copy of Ulysses across the parking lot. Conversation about the way our emotions are involved in our learning process are a great way of acknowledging discouragement without letting it be the end of the story. Normalizing the feelings of struggle, of picking yourself up and trying again, of using failure to discover a way through to success are not only empathetic strategies, they are also great ways of cultivating a growth mindset in students. Every single one of the strategies that I've mentioned work in online teaching environments whether as offline assignments, breakout group prompts, or as part of dedicated class time. I think one of the best things about our national experiment in remote learning is the renewed sense of the precious social quality of our time together. It is a time for building relationships and cultivating connections. Far from the validation of credit worthiness, class time matters because it gives us our richest opportunities for conveying care and for creating a mutually supporting inclusive atmosphere that best promotes learning in all of our students. I'm going to end with a brief interlude of introspection because I have the advantage of speaking in the middle of this series. And that gives me the opportunity to respond to a little of what we've heard from earlier speakers. If we were all gathered for one of those lovely all plenary colloquia, this sort of crisscrossing of our questions and interests would be happening, happening naturally, both in the question periods and in our coffee chat during breaks. Harmut's lovely talk last week made me think hard about my relationship with my digital devices, including this screen through which I'm reaching you, which is indeed a pleasure and a privilege, so certainly not all bad. For people of my generation who remember prohibitively expensive long distance phone calls and flimsy blue fold over air letters, the easy and cheap connections afforded by Skype, FaceTime, and now Zoom still retain a little of the shimmer of the magical device. We have palantirs in our pockets. And to speak of our smartphones, especially in this time of isolation from one another, I have come, like Hartmut, to appreciate the phone call over the Zoom session as a digital device that permits what seems like a more normal and authentic connection with another's voice. Back in August, I wrote a little poem about the a coronavirus era phone conversation, a conversation with my dad. 
I hope it offers you a little fragment of the imaginative extension into another circumstances that literary empathy invites and that you find in it some commonalities with your own experiences of this terrible pandemic. It is called Birthday Call 2020. My 85 year old father cooks tomato sauce, this time with eggplant out of the laden beds of his kitchen garden perched on the bar stool to reach the heavy kettle, flipping nubs of cut onion into the pot. There is some splashing. I wish I were there to wipe down those counters, deal with the sticky floor. Instead, I hold the cold slab of the phone in my two palms and receive his voice in cupped hands, my progenitor, my first poet, maker of fine sauces and of my sisters both so far away. Thanks for your attention. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate how practical it was that, that you actually said, not only is there's an opportunity here, but there are problems. So here are some things that you can do. And I, I've seen some of our attendees. Um, there is at least one dean attending. So. Um, so thank you very much for the practical advice. We, uh, I have some questions. I'm sure Fritz has questions, but we'd like to start with the audience and, and let them engage with you first. Um, so we first have um, James Story, and I'm going to try to find him here and unmute him. We're trying to do the, the voice thing since last week's talk. So let's see if James would like to speak and share his great story. We'd love that. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope you can. We can hear you. Yep. Very good. Professor Keene, thank you for that. That was a wonderful talk. It sounds like you are a kindred spirit to me. If you could see me, you would see a, a chain around my neck with the one ring on it. We are. We are <laughs> Don't um, wear it too much, James. <laughs> oh, I did. I wore it for years and years and years. And then I took it. Anyway, um, I am reading The Hobbit aloud to my three-year-old, as I did with my five-year-old. Um, and interesting things are happening. And as a young father, I'm paying close attention to kind of their emotional development. And when they show signs of empathy, I get really excited, right? <laughs> because they're so young. A three-year-old has, at least in, as far as I understand, like no prefrontal cortex to speak of, right? So, <laughs> so when the, the little child tells me that she feels sorry for Gollum in The Hobbit, I, I, I'm struck by the power of fiction to pull this reaction from her. So my question is kind of a, a childhood development and then a, a, a neuroplasticity question about, and, and my only exposure to this is reading Bruno Bettelheim, The Child's Need for Magic or Piaget like when, when doing some, some teacher training stuff uh, many, many years ago. I'm curious and I've always been operating, operating under the assumption that the, as the biology changes in my students as they get older, like the older I get them, the higher the likelihood is that the fiction that we read is going to work <laughs> and accomplish this objective <laughs> of, of getting them to, to understand uh, other perspectives. But I don't know whether that is grounded in science or just inductive reasoning from my own experience, where like the, the big uh, empathy progress that I made in my own life happened at age 28, like way later than when the students are, are coming across it. So I'm curious if in your research or if you just know, <laughs> this, this, so this, this is, uh, I'm going to answer this from the perspective of a person who's read a lot of developmental psychology, but I am not a developmental psychologist. So first of all, your insight, your, your instinct, I think is right, that there is a change in, um, in our brains as we grow and as, as we grow in relationships with others, because our brains are not isolated from our social circumstances, and that those things do shape and form us. And that indeed exposure to fiction across a lifetime, especially with that wonderful example that you give of reading to a child when so young, can promote certain kinds of mental visualizing and imagining and uh, perspective taking and role taking and practice it. So certainly it, it's not all available in the most mature, complicated sense to a little child, but the, the bases for human empathy and for the more mature expression of empathy and sympathy or pro-social action is present even in neonates. Mm -hmm. And so inside a, a neonate room there, you will observe if one little baby cries days old or even hours old, the other ones oh, in the room will pick up those, those cries and echo them, which is indicating there is some kind of near automatic connection that 
that happens between children. Secondly, um, when it comes to representations, because you're interested in that specific thing of how uh, as we grow, we respond in a more and more complex way to representations. There's some fascinating research with, again, with pre-verbal, not pre-verbal children, but certainly pre-literate children, um, with little, little children, showing that they they tell um, stories that add um, both affective interpretations and and either and senses of empathy or some senses of antipathy to completely random movements of projected images that are either um, round images or rectangular images in these kind of little videos of, of shapes moving around on a screen that little, little kids will attribute feelings of sympathy or feelings of fearing for one of those little shapes, which suggests that there is something in our way of interpreting the prompts of the world around us that uh, it moves in the direction towards a kind of um, anthropomorphizing imagination of things outside of ourselves, even among the very young. Um, why that's interesting to me as an empathy scholar is that the very first sort of conception of empathy actually comes from the, Ger the German Einfühlung and is developed in the field of German aesthetics about our responses to inanimate objects, not people. The, the thing about connecting to people is a sort of slightly later stage of development in the, the sort of intellectual history of the concept. Um, your, you know, your story is a wonderful one about um, your child's <laughs> remarkable, remarkable um, sympathy for, for Gollum. Um, I had a much less mature response to my earliest um, encounter with uh, the, the Lord of the Rings. My dad, who you've just been seeing on the screen, read me The Hobbit when I was about in um, kindergarten before I was allowed to learn how to read. Um, but then I went on later in grade school to read The Lord of the Rings, and I was so upset at Frodo um, that I changed the ending of that novel in my mind. Um, and in the end, the real end of the story, you guys may not realize, is that Frodo, he dies. Later on, when I reread the novels and Frodo was not dead at the end, I realized that I had killed him in my mind because of his failure to um, cast Gollum and the ring into the volcano. So you'll realize that I was like two steps at, at seven or eight or nine. I was two steps behind your kid at three um, oh, because God. I hadn't realized that actually that that moment of of actually true compassion and forgiveness to Gollum is the thing that that saves everything in the end. Um, well, yeah, so, how so kudos, kudos to your kid. Yeah, how fleeting is the three-year-old's thought? It's in her head and it's gone the next. The five-year-old has a much different reaction for sure. Well, thank, you for, that, thank you for that answer. It, it, the, the only other thing I'll say is that I'm like you, I'm uh, a, a literature professor and I'm, I made the switch uh, after Jacob Blake and George Floyd uh, I, because I could. Uh, I decided to teach all black authors um, in my intro to fiction class. So these are students who are not English majors. They That's are. great. And this was this was my the only power I had in the circuit. It's, it's not a, it's not an only power. It's a big power. And, you know, if you do that kind of thing and, and you can do it in so many ways, like for many years, I've been I have I'm an English professor, so I have I have a lot of flexibility about what I put on my syllabi. But having equal numbers of male and female writers, always having writers of color, attempting, if at all possible, to have writers who um, express different sexual identities mm -hmm. and, or write about characters that are expressing different sexual identities have all been very, very powerful drivers of engagement on the part of my students. And, and sometimes the thing that's so great about that, James, is that you may not see the impact today, um, but 10 years from now, you may have a student write to you and tell you what it meant that you built that syllabus that way. Very often the, the response is a delayed response. It takes a while for the, the penny to drop or the impact to be recognized. It's well worth doing. Well, thank you. And the only, only question I was going to ask was what other steps you were taking in your own literature classrooms to, to make. And it sounds like I'm at least on the right path. <laughs> you are. You are. We should probably go to other questions. It looks like there's some other people. Thank you. So, Fritz, would you like to ask a question? And then I'll, I'll work with the audience to see what they're saying. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Um, thank you, Suzanne. That was so rich, and there's so many things to engage here. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for um, referencing some of our previous speakers. Um, some of their talks, of course, are on our YouTube channel, so people can reference that. That's very good. Um, and I also love it that you brought, brought up um, Octavia Butler, who would have been another star, just like yourself, on our series. I think she would have been on my list absolutely to have to try to get her in this, this group here. Um, so um, 
I, I also um, um, want to know more about your ideas there about using narrative and narrative thinking to engage people. I found your list of ideas that you offered us um, towards the end of the talk incredibly rich to say, well, this is things we can do. We can promote people to take perspectives, to use escapist fiction, a lot of these kind of things to train this narrative mobility. Um, would that be something that you would say that we should kind of really anchor in the curriculum everywhere um, to say really what we need to kind of promote in our students is narrative thinking to tell stories from many perspectives you yourself actually gave us wonderful examples when you briefly referred to the fate of some of your colleagues there who were sitting in a car in the cold trying to teach even these mini stories i mean i was that was thinking oh my gosh i mean i mean wonderful for these people and wonderful for the hamilton community to have devoted professors like that but it was also a rich story right the way is that something we can in include? I mean, can say this is something not just for English classes, but something, a real element that will take to the next dimension here? Well, I mean, I think so. And I, I think that it, it is simply taking advantage of the, the capacities of our brains and of the way we are as social beings, that, that narrative is one of the many ways that, that we just make knowledge stickier. And when I think of an example of this that comes from outside of the English classroom, long ago now, more than 15 years ago, when I was getting ready to write Empathy in the novel, I realized rapidly that I was a complete um, ignoramus about psychology and neuroscience. And I needed to study uh, the, the, the subject seriously be, to be able to read the literature that I was digging up in Psych Info. And so I started taking classes with my, my professor colleagues at Washington and Lee. And the first class that I took was a class called Brain and Behavior. It was the first class in the neuroscience sequence. It was taught by a wonderful colleague named Tyler Lorig, who's a neuroscientist of smell. And he is just a genius of storytelling. And he made that entire course, it was all this, you know, huge amounts of like brute memorization when you're, you're doing your first neuroscience course, tons of memorization. And he just made it all so easy to retain and remember and understand and, and get because he, he wove everything into story. And I think that, that there are some disciplines where it may feel more alien, but the fact is, is that everybody in the room who's learning the subject is a person who has a natural habit for narrative. We all do. So I think it's a great thing to take advantage of. It doesn't have to be, as you, you the example you suggested, it can be quite fleeting. It can be a very small uh, piece of story for to make things stickier and more memorable. But it, I think it really does, really does work and is to be recommended, even if you're not having your students read anything that would be, you know, sort of normally recognized as literary. Great. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I'm we, I'm 100% uh, on board of that. I mean, I really would say that can be one of these many things we should really do. I mean, promote storytelling in student learning. They should learn it. Everyone can, I mean, engage with it. Learning, I mean, they know it, as you said. And as James, um, as James Story's story right now also just showed this kids crave stories. I mean, I'm, my own kids, of course, they still remember all the little stories I made up when they were two years old and three years old. That's probably their all these memories are stories. They hold on to that. That's wonderful. Um, I wanted to just say that I'm glad I'm actually glad you used an example of the story you told about a colleague in psychology, because in psychology, sometimes we say a narrative is an anecdote and therefore, you know, not scientific, but that's separating like the purpose of teaching from doing good science. So, of course, when we look at science, we want to uh, have good data, but when we teach science, we want to have good stories. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a, a question from Amir Pasek, who is the Dean of the School of Philanthropy. So I'm going to allow him to talk if he wants. Um, if we don't hear from him, we will just uh, read the question. Are you there, Amir? I'm here. I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, thank you. It was a wonderful talk. I was just uh, wondering about um, uh, the concept of community. Is that something that you find useful as you're, you're th thinking about um, empathetic relationships that end up sticking with us and in the fact that sometimes they they're intertwined in an intimate community that seems to be the locus for so much important learning and discovery including an intimate community like Hamilton College absolutely absolutely I think community so when we talk of relationship um, the, I would say the next sort of 
frame of reference outside of relationship is the community in which those relationships are, are structured. Um, and, and there's concentric circles out around it. So you will have any college or university will have its more distant communities that are important to it, like the parents of students and the alums and the people who are the supporters of the institution, all those things matter as well. It's part of a broader community. I think it's vitally important that people feel like they have a sense of belonging. And of course, in these days of um, trauma, national trauma around uh, injuries, terrible injuries and death inflicted on communities of color, that sense of belonging is, is harmed by so many um, of these actions and people that are inside of our communities are feeling threatened, even though that we like to think that they're in a safe place at their college or university, those, those outward harms damage the, the sort of web of connection inside our own communities. So things that we can be doing as educators every single day to enhance a sense of you belong here, um, you know, you're not, you're not just being tolerated but you're being actually welcomed and you're a vitally important part of everybody's positive experience, I think is especially acutely important in, in these days when our anti-racist work has got to be front and center of what we're thinking about, even if it doesn't seem immediately directly related to the discipline in which we, in which we strive. I think it really is relevant to all of us. So thank you for that. I will say that, that in terms of empathy and narrative empathy in particular, there's a kind of empathy that's that's relatively easy, which is the empathy for the in-group. And we could say that an in-group includes, you know, the people of a college campus, the, the, the college staff, the faculty, the students, like the, it's relatively easy. If we heard that one of our number had died of COVID, um, we, whether we knew that person or not, we would feel a special sense of injury um, because of of the closeness of our of our immediate community. But narrative empathy has the capacity to help us sort of leap over the distances and get out there in the way that we think farther away from our in-group and potentially in a way that I sometimes describe as being ambassadorial, sometimes find a way of being able to connect with that same kind of intensity of care and concern with people who are far away from us and who are different from us and whose experiences are sometimes even completely unrecognizable to us. And that I think is one of the most powerful reasons for cultivating students' knowledge. And that I, I do that by teaching fiction, but you can do it with a lot of different subject areas just to sort of have an expanded sense of knowledge of the way people's lives are in different parts, not just, not just in the places that we know. Thanks. I have a question too, as I was uh, listening, I was reflecting on my own teaching and also my children are being homeschooled and they're, um, you know, they're getting teaching from me in the background and also their, their teachers at school. And I think in both cases, one of the things that is very hard with digital domains is, is having one key practice of empathy, which is active listening. Because we're often like in presentation mode. And it's very hard if you have a group, as you said, if you have a group of 20 or more people, it's very hard to really listen in in some way you can actively listen through through watching body language and the usual thing that you would do in a classroom, but also actually like giving time in the classroom for voices. So so do you have ideas about how to actively listen? Or do you think that that's even important uh, concept when you're doing online learning for empathy. So I think it's, first of all, I think it's such a fundamental of great teaching, active listening, and probably the hardest thing to practice and learn how to do, especially uh, if there are people on the call who are beginning teachers, you'll know that that slightly panicked feeling that you have where you have a lesson plan, you have certain things you want to get to. There's a, you've asked a question, a student is talking, and half of you is listening to the answer that the student is giving. The other half of you is planning the next three steps that you need to take. And you're, you know, you really are not actually giving that student the full attention. So I think that practice and training and active listening is, is a just absolutely core fundamental aspect of, of good teaching. And I totally agree with you that it's very much challenged by the um, online modalities. The little um, breakout rooms help. I think the use of breakout rooms on Zoom is a way where, especially if the instructor can sort of pop in and out and visit the rooms without scaring the students too much, um, that, that's a good way. But I do think that it's not, it, it's important to acknowledge that it's, it's a discipline, it's hard to do, that sometimes 
our impulses as teachers are to step in and fix things and step in and, and help somebody out, step in and finish a sentence. And that we uh, probably all of us were that student in the class many years ago that couldn't stand the silence in the classroom. And so threw the hand up and answered the question. Probably all of us have that personality type. And that personality type is actually inimical to active listening, that you have to not want to fill the air. You have to not want to paper over the awkward silence. You have to kind of sit it out. And it's so awkward to learn how to do, but it's really an important part of listening. And I think it's acutely, it feels like dead air when you're on Zoom. If you're just waiting, you know, you don't have the kind of little body language and the shuffles and the, you can't really read everybody's face to see, you know, how students have those participation cues that have nothing to do with raising their hands. Very hard to see on, very hard to see on Zoom. So I think there are, um, there are some deep challenges. There are some mechanical tactics that you can use just to make sure that I always try on the first day of a class, no matter what the size, that everybody hears his or her voice speaking in that classroom or in that space on the first day. So that is never a barrier that has to be breached in the future. And it's just like, you just, that's why low stakes work is so important. You just find ways to bring everybody in and get everybody engaged. And it's worth the time. It's worth the time that it spends, that you spend to get people talking, even if it's something that's not, um, you know, be a takeaway substance uh, from your syllabus. So I you know, strongly endorse that idea, Sarah. Yeah, that's actually helpful to hear because I was thinking somehow as I was reflecting on how to ask the question that active listening is somehow related to obviously the voice and, and there's a challenge of the voice with this online mode. So getting, I love the tip of getting every student to be comfortable with speaking. So at least that's not a barrier. Right, exactly. Because then then they can't have that thing in their own head where they're like, oh, I've never, I've never answered a question in this class before. When am I going to do it? And it's like, no, everybody already has. And right. And I do think that students hate the thing called cold calling where you just call on them, but you can create a classroom culture. And I love doing this where if there's no cold calling, there's just tons of games and fun. And I actually have a wonderful anecdote if I have time to share about a contrast between two Ulysses classes that I taught in two back-to-back -back springs. This was a month long course where the kids read Ulysses. That's basically what they did. And after Proteus, I would get them through Proteus, but uh, teaching them the, each episode. But after Proteus, they were presenting the episodes to the whole class. So the responsibility fell on them. And this first class just was a bunch of goofballs who made games and like they, one of them brought in kidneys and made us all eat kidneys and like they, they just did the most hilarious funny things to discuss their episodes of Ulysses throughout the term. The following semester, following year, same, same format, I taught a group that was so scholarly and studious and it was all PowerPoint slides and very formal presentations and they were dressing up and you know it was just a completely different vibe and the, the test scores on an identical examination the kids in the fun group that played around and, and in the end had a, my husband had a lockout buzzer system, the kind that you use for like a Jeopardy game. And we, we practiced, they, they, they wanted to, they wanted to practice for the exam by playing a trivia game about things that happen in Ulysses. That group aced the final, the fun and games group and the serious, like hardworking, but you know, they, they'd all read the book, but I have like empirical evidence that fun and games resulted in stickier, stickier learning. So I, I think it's uh, great to have fun in the classroom. Great. Um, I love that, of course. Playing games and designing games, cr creating roles for the students is wonderful. Um, I would love to follow up on one um, remark you made about um, your students in Hamilton now during the pandemic who um, said um, in many cases that they could feel for their teachers. Um, and that I, th I found that very interesting because um, we are thinking a lot about, of course, for all the students in different situations and what their hardships. But of course, there's also the other side of the teachers who are, and you gave us some examples of that. My question here is, um, and it's actually a double question, but the first question of that is, um, do you think actually, um, and it sounds like yes, but I just want you to elaborate a little bit on this. Is it good for the students to feel like empathy with their teachers, thereby basically feeling they're part of the community? 
I mean, they're becoming part of the thing. So, so indeed, I mean, what I'm doing here with my, even with the video screen background here, hiding all the mess behind me that you can now imagine is actually counterproductive. I mean, it's actually making, being human is actually a good part of teaching. That's the first part of the question. And you kind of have answered it, but I still want to emphasize that a little bit. The second part here is the one where you talked about offering early on in your talk, you, you said it is good for students to offer them different positions so feel for, empathize for. So would you say that team teaching or bringing in the teaching assistants or other kind of people there um, really is, is, a, is a thing that we should really promote much more? I mean, team teaching is a difficult thing as many institutions for, but for institutional reasons, not for pedagogical reasons. But it sounds like, hmm, maybe there's something we should change to offer more positions for people. So I'll answer the bit about team teaching first, because I think that it's, first of all, I think team teaching is really hard work. And anybody who hasn't done it, who imagines that being a team teacher is going to be sort of half the work because there's somebody share. No, it's going to be so much more work than teaching your own thing. But it's really rewarding if you have a partner who is a, a really great team teacher, especially if they bring something that you can't bring. And I've had some really precious um, experiences of team teaching in my life, including one with the great poet John Hollander. When I was a young woman, I was a team teacher with him and I learned so much. I mean, just absolutely priceless experience. But I will say that as a student, I had some team taught courses and I was, you know, I was such a little jerk. It was like there was the really great professor who I loved, and then there was the really boring professor who sucked. And believe me, on the course evaluations, being you know the little barbarian that I was at the time, I, I was made that perfectly clear, but I was not alone. All the other students that felt the way I did. And so the, 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 dry, the dry sort of teacher of the Italian Renaissance art would, you know, people would sort of endure his lectures. And then the Northern Renaissance guy would come in and it was all fabulous. And people would applaud at the end of his lectures. <laughs> and then the, you know, later as an adult, I just like have pangs for how horrible that must have been for the poor Italian Renaissance guy. You know, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's tough. It's hard to compete when you have a, 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 a kind of a glamorous partner. And so some team teaching can be really socially challenging. I, I think, especially in the lecture mode. But yes, yeah, sure, it's great to multiply figures of authority. It's great to give students themselves a chance to have authority in the classroom because that also shares out the sense of where expertise can lie. In terms of that question of having students recognize the humanity of their faculty, it, th I think this is such a basic thing that we forget it because a lot of students who, you know, if, you, if you're not a student who grew up in a college community, I did. I, I'm a faculty brat. So for me, college professors were just like people like my, my dad, like not, not hard for me to imagine and not hard for me to approach, not hard for me to talk to. But some students have such a sense of reverence or awe or distrust of, for, about faculty as a category that that simple thing of realizing, oh, wait, that person is actually a person who maybe is of an age that that person is more vulnerable to COVID or or that person who I sometimes get aggravated with because I don't get work back instantly after I've submitted it has three kids climbing all over her, um, you know, who are at home while she's trying to teach, and you know, and and just like all the sort of humanizing glimpses that students have had, I it just I saw copious evidence of it, and because I um, I do read the evaluations of the of the teaching it's a small school so this is it takes me about a week but it's not it's thousands of evaluations but it's only hundreds of faculty so it's not it's not an impossible task and it's a, it's illuminating because first of all it's such a it's such a great experience to see how much the faculty's efforts are appreciated in a normal term and in a term like the one that we went through in the fall um, it was just extraordinary noticing how much um, forbearance and compassion and understanding the students showed. I think I think it asked, we were asking our students, and this is true nationwide, we were asking our students to be more mature because we were asking them to uphold uh, behavioral contracts so that they didn't, it, it's not so much making one another sick, although that's bad, um, but it's just so that they didn't make the communities that we are all located in sick and and potentially harming um, people who are uh, older people or more vulnerable people in the community. So we we really have have asked them 
to step up. And I think at least at Hamilton, by and large, that has been what has happened. I will say, in, in I was talking about this very question of the relationships and the humanity that seems to be just much more present to us in this moment with a student about an hour before this webinar started. And the student said, you know, it's really true. I would have never criticized what my faculty member was doing in a class. But back in March, after we went online, there were some things that this faculty member was trying. But because I felt like we had a relationship, I could say to the faculty member, this thing that you're doing isn't working. Can we try something else? And the faculty member took it in, in stride and adapted to the news. I mean, this is this is like students don't often understand that actually faculty will adapt and will respond that they don't know. <laughs> You know, that actually you just have to tell them and telling them at the end on a end of course evaluation is like the worst place because it's over then. Um, but but that kind of sense of of it's not exactly equal footing. Nobody can take out the hierarchical aspect of of the grade is going to be given in the end. One person has a PhD, one does not. You know, you can't take that out of the relationship and it's important in other ways. But the sense of shared humanity, I think permits communication that's better, that's more efficacious, and lets people respond in the moment to things where there's still time to do course corrections. So I think it's really important, Fritz. Great, thank you, thank you. No, I, I, I love that, I mean, um, so the one positive of, I mean, there's a couple of positives actually in the pandemic that you have given us here, but one of them is indeed that there is also a new way to think about that shared community that we are all sitting at these screens and that's how we relate and we, we are human beings with, um, with family, with messy situations, with various issues that becomes <laughs> absolutely visible. Um, and so, so maybe there's, 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 there's some positives after all that we can take out of this when we move forward now. Wow, amazing. Um, Thank you so much. I remember we are coming to the end. We're actually at the end now. So, um, um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. I think everyone here will uh, hope that many people will see also the recording of this. So, for those who you're listening here, please make sure that people um, see this. People who are um, teachers, professors, deans in charge, they, they're, they're actually concrete proposals. I mean, how we should think about education in the future, what we should change here. I, I love that. Thank you. I mean, you gave us everything from the theory to very concrete ideas. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we knew why we wanted to have you. Thank you. And you came. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on that note, um, since we're at the end of it, um, um, it is my greatest uh, pleasure here uh, to also point to another person we absolutely have to have in this series, Sarah Conrad, who will be um, part of the presenting team next week in the format of a debate. So I hope- Yes, that... I am going to be the good cop for empathy and technology. So guess what that makes Fritz? <laughs> <laughs> I do what comes natural to me. So this is easy. I'll be the bad cop. <laughs> so we will have a friendly debate. Friendly, but yes, debate <laughs> next week. Join us same time, 12 o'clock EST, same link to register. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing some familiar and new people next week. Thanks for being here. And thanks again, Dr. Keen. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.